Okay, welcome back. And this is Issues in Biotechnology. Um, I wanted to go over now the second part of tonight's lecture. But we are in the first section of this describing the mechanics of life. What is it? And we need to set the stage tonight to, first of all, get our head around what is science. That might sound like a dumb question too, but um, there is a growing distrust of science in the United States. I am not exactly sure why this is. Maybe you can come up with your own socio-economic, politico ideas about that. Uh, but what is science? Um, is something that we need to understand in order to address the later applications of biotechnology and how we got there. Uh, this is my contact information. I'm Albert Kausch. And my office is in the Food Science and Nutrition Building off campus in West Kingston. Um, I hold office hours out there from 12 to 3 p.m. on Wednesdays before this course. Uh, and you can also um, enter into the chat room discussion as it is posted on the Sakai site. Our laboratory out there conducts research on uh, agricultural biotechnology in general. Uh, I have handed out hard copies of the syllabus and the course requirements separately. There is a description of the course you might want to read over on that one document. Uh, what is an introduction to this class? Uh, what I hope you get out of it? And uh, really the rationale for teaching this course. Uh, the other document relates to the syllabus itself. <clears throat> uh, which we will be starting at the top of this document and working our way down. I think you should pay special attention to this. This uh, tells you what the lectures will be about. I've constructed brief abstracts on each lecture. <clears throat> uh, so you can see in a summary what this is about. And following that, are the uh, assignments for the week and when each quiz will be. I would recommend uh, that you also go to the Sakai site. Somebody mentioned that they were there recently. We've been updating this uh, fast and furiously. I think uh, you'll see this recent version on there now. The text is uh, what is life? And actually, I've been uh, asking this question, what is life, in this class before this book was published. So I, I don't know who ripped who off here, but it's a, um, I think it's a, it's a pretty good treatment of that question. Uh, we will be relying on that heavily in the first half of the course, so I would recommend that you get that. And there are assigned readings and some of the questions that appear on quizzes are directly from that textbook. Also, attendance is absolutely mandatory. Um, I say that largely with your best interest in mind. Uh, there is a direct correlation in the past between who comes to class and their grade um, for a couple of reasons. Um, but. I think that your participation in this class is uh, helpful for not only getting an understanding of the subject material, but um, also for your participation. Hence these eye clicker devices. So not only uh, your participation with the eye clicker devices, but um, also there will be one quiz per week. I would strongly recommend that you don't miss those. A zero on a quiz will ding your grade like you can't believe. Now here's another thing. I sincerely want all of you to get an A in this class. I'll tell you how to do it. 
I really want, this is not a class to weed anybody out of going into med school or anything like that. I really want you to understand all of this material. So the eye clicker registrations, you have them now. Uh, turn them on. You should see a light come on. Everybody have batteries? Yes? So there is a registration number on the back. Register that with your student ID number at the iClicker website. One of the first questions that will appear in every beginning of every lecture will be, are you here? This will help me uh, take your attendance and know that you are participating in the class. Again, attendance is absolutely mandatory. And there will be a quiz every week. So um, the quizzes in this live version on campus will be paper quizzes comprised of study guide questions. At the end of each lecture, there are a series of multiple choice questions, which I post on the Sakai site. And I'll show you at the end of the lecture tonight what those look like. I would strongly recommend that you go through those study guide questions and answer each one of them in preparation for the quiz. If you do that, you will be studying for an A. I would recommend that you study for an A. If you study for, and that's not just for this class. If you study for an A, the least you can probably get is a B. If you study for a B, you might get a C. If you study for a C, you might get a D. And if you study for a D, well, I guess it doesn't matter. That's up to you. So in the on-campus version, we will be having uh, a quiz every week. Um, and we can discuss any of these questions. If you are online, um, after completing the first two quizzes, the first each, le each set of lectures are according to the syllabus. Uh, you will be taking a quiz that will be promptly graded. So the quizzes will be consisting of 20 of the usually 30 questions that are in the study guides. So the 20 questions are right out of the 30 question study guide. If you do the 30 question study guide, things will go well for you. There are no makeups. I used to do this until I have heard every excuse under the sun, including one guy whose mother died twice in one semester. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, and I've also noticed that people who take makeup quizzes generally don't improve their grades that much. So if I were you, stay on target. Keep up with things. Don't get behind. As you saw in that first lecture, we're going to cover some ground here. And there is not another course like this anywhere. There's not a textbook for this class. Because this field changes so quickly, by the time anybody wrote one, it wouldn't be any good anyway. I mean, I keep things very up to date for this class. I work on things really right up until the last minute to do that. <clears throat> there are two exams. There'll be a midterm after lecture 19 or so. It's posted in the syllabus. The midterm will cover the first half of the course. And it will also be comprised of study guide questions pooled from the whole set of study guide questions. So if you know all the study guide questions to that point, generally people do pretty well. That's worth 30% of your grade. 30% of your grade is from quizzes and attendance. 
I can ding you an attendance because of how that figures into quizzes. So two exams, a midterm and a final. I often put a written question in two. I think it's quiz number seven this year. And I might ask you, what is life? You could start to prepare for that now or wait until we examine it somewhat. But I would suggest about three paragraphs. I've recently written my own, so I'll show you that as we go along too. There's also a stock project that I'll get into in lecture number six, where I will encourage you to invest $100,000 in biotechnology stocks and see how they do over the semester. So you will submit a one-page report on your five biotech stocks after lecture number six, by lecture number eight, and then you will log out at the last lecture and calculate your losses and gains. And we can just see, in this economy, given random investment from people who perhaps don't know all that much about biotechnology yet, how they would fare in the stock market. I also will ask that all electronic devices are turned off prior to class, just like on an airplane, including cell phones, laptops, iPads, iPods, and other handheld devices, and also no talking. That might seem severe, but I have had so many complaints in the past from other students who are annoyed by their fellow students and the disruptions. I think that's legitimate. And someone asked me about taking notes. I think this guy over here has got the right idea. As old school as it might be. Um, on the other hand, I think that all of this material will be available to you on the web. Previous lectures are available on YouTube, and all of the PowerPoints will be available on Sakai for your review. I would suggest then that if you wanted to take notes, you take notes on your ideas about the PowerPoint slides themselves. So respect your fellow students. Actually, it bums me out, too. And it's kind of distracting, you know? Um, it's hard to keep it clear train of thought when there's disruptions, especially during poetry parts. So the eye clicker uh, registration, let's, let's give a go at that. Testing one, two, three, are you here? Yes, A, B, no, C, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's good, okay. Um, I will be taking this data. It is entirely anonymous. I really don't care what your answer is, and I'm way too busy to look it up, you know? So consider these devices and your answers entirely anonymous. They are. So we will ask some pretty sensitive questions during this class. For example, are you a Yankees fan or a Boston Red Sox fan? Or maybe a Mets fan or some other team, or you just really don't care about baseball at all. <laughs> Look at that. 39% don't care about baseball. <laughs> but we are, we are on the dividing line, you know. If you go just south from here about an hour, this graph would be reversed in A and B. And there's how it was last semester. So we can compare our results in some of these polls. And I want to add to these, you know, a growing database, more data. OK, a little bit about your peers. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see what the demographics are of the class. Are you a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or a teacher? Whoa, look at that. Cool. OK, 
pretty much all across the board. That's good. There's how it was last year, pretty much the same. A few more freshmen this year. Are you a life sciences major? Science major, but not life science. Non-science major, general or undeclared. And if you're not a life science major, don't worry about it. Because uh, I have seen in the past that it truly does not matter. You are, a, if you're a business major, art major, music major, or whatever, uh, this is an equal opportunity class. You have just about the same um, likelihood of getting uh, an A as anybody else. At least that's how I tried to construct the course. See, so you guys do not have a distinct advantage, even though you might think you do. And um, even though we'll be covering some things that you life sciences majors may have had in other classes, I'll bet you will be, we will be considering some things that you haven't thought of previously. Undecided. Non-science, 33%, good. Last year also. So how much do you know about biotechnology in general right now? A lot. I know the basics, public press, very little actually, but enough to get in some arguments, or nothing at all. A lot. We know one person knows a lot. Good. So when I can't be here, you can take over. It's about the same as last year. Republican, Democrat, Independent, Socialist, or other. Now, you know, you might ask, well, what business is that of yours, Dr. Couch? Well, actually, in a class like this, we can see how politics has affected policymaking in all kinds of sectors from forensic databasing to stem cell research and so on. So um, I think it is relevant. And we ought to know our peer group. Mm. Undecided, undecided, undecided. OK. There you go. These days, I think discussing American politics is a little like discussing the gourmet qualities of a Big Mac, but that's maybe my point of view. And again, last year we had a predominantly Democrat, Democrat-dominated class. I consider myself religious, somewhat religious, secular, somewhat secular, or that's irrelevant to this course. These are out of the uh, last year's census or the previous census. You can look up the national demographics on this. So religious would be defined as uh, affiliated and attending regularly. Somewhat religious is affiliated and attending, I think, on major holidays. Secular, I think, is evident. Somewhat secular, I don't know what that means. Um, and irrelevant, you're certainly welcome to choose that. Kind of similar. Last year was more religious than this year. I'm pro-choice, pro-life, undecided, don't care about politics, circumstantial. And you might ask that this is perhaps none of my business either, but actually uh, right-to-life issues have figured heavily into uh, embryonic stem cell research policy. And that where are you going to get those embryos figures into whether or not embryonic stem cell research should be funded or supported. That's one example. Predominantly pro-choice, that seems to figure. And that's last year's. Okay, 
we see our eye clickers are working. That's good. Uh, we will use these during the course. I will uh, enter in study guide questions throughout the lectures, particularly after we cover some concept which will be uh, covered during the quiz. Uh, and if, you know, most of you get it right, we'll move on. And if we see a problem, we can back up and um, go over things that seem somewhat unclear. So now let's, let's start into this adventure. What is life? Um, and it's very basic. When did it start on Earth? Uh, by best estimations now, this universe is 13.2 billion years old, if you go with Einstein. The Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago, cooled down about 4.2 billion years ago, and the first living organisms as single prokaryotic cells appear at about 3.2 billion years. It took a long time then to get from single cells to multi-cells. Where did life come from? How did that happen? It's still an uh, open question since nobody was there to, to actually see that. How do we deduce this going backwards in time? How did this happen from a molecular way out to these organisms that we have today? If it happened like that here, how could it happen somewhere else? It's a big universe. Actually, there are some people who think that maybe 3.2 billion years isn't long enough to get to where we are and that perhaps DNA zoomed in on a meteor. And once you have DNA, pretty much the rest of this seems pretty obvious to most people. But what is this? How did this happen? How did we get all of this complexity? That seems um, counterintuitive, that we could go from something simple to something complex. Can we understand life from its mechanism? If you pull a piece out of a car, you might not understand how that car works in its total. And now, once we consider these kinds of things, how does this influence uh, philosophy? Like, what are you doing here? I don't mean just in this class. Is there purpose? Biologists think about things like function. They say, you know, um, You know, why does a bird have feathers? Uh, a bird did not consciously make feathers in order to fly. That's impossible. I would love to have feathers too. But as much as I think about it, that just doesn't happen. So, biology itself cannot be purposive. We look at things in terms of their function. You might be struck by a sunflower in terms of the pattern of the seeds in that flower. And actually, there's a mathematical equation that you can use to describe that pattern called the Fibonacci series. And you might be struck by its beauty. Or about how leaves are arranged in a whirl on a vine going up. And you might say at first, simply, how beautiful but realize that the function of that pattern is related to maximizing photosynthesis. So rather than looking at anything biological and asking the question, what is its purpose? Really, you might ask first, what is its function? Then everything shifts. I can tell when someone's looking at me from behind. Yes, no, sometimes. Sometimes. A lot of sometimes. Really? 
without any other information? How do you do that? Science is a system of hypothesis making and testing. And I want to bring that point up in terms of this class because really we want to look at all of these different aspects of biology and biotechnology in terms of evidence. There is a lot of applications that we see that are based on uh, something less than evidence. And I'll get into some of those as we go through this class. Uh, but we are primarily based on evidence in this class. Uh, we're interested in facts. We're interested in studies which show what we think to be true. Now, facts, obviously, is a moving target in time. Today's facts may well be tomorrow's belly laugh. That's been true in the past. You can think about many things like this. The earth is flat. You might fall off, kind of thing. So, um, the first chapter of your book I'd recommend reading this week. Uh, what is scientific thinking? And how do we think critically? Not just, what do we feel about something? What do we actually, how can we get a handle on this reality? As humans, we get tricked into thinking that what we see here is a good representation of reality. What you see with your eye is just a small sliver of data of what could possibly be around you. The visible light, ra light range is very narrow when you exclude ultraviolet on one end and infrared on the other, not to mention radio waves and x-rays. There's a lot more information here than you can get a handle on. There's a book I'd recommend by Robert Piercig called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It happens to be a true story, but it is a very interesting uh, description uh, about Western versus Eastern thought. It's not very factual on Zen Buddhism or on motorcycle maintenance, but um, he has some interesting ideas about science, the scientific method, uh, and actually Zen. But there is a part on page 29 where he says, out of all of this awareness, we must select. And what we select and call consciousness is never the same as the awareness because the process of selection mutates it. Out of the endless landscape of awareness, we take a handful of sand and call that the world. You see how limited our point of view is? So, biotechnology and society, what do we believe? There is a rise in autism, noticeably. Why is that? Some people suggest it has to do with vaccination. Is that true? What about steroids that might be coming in from milk products? What does the public press have to say about perceptions that guide our policy making governing science? What should we believe? Why do you believe what you believe? There are all kinds of beliefs, superstitions notwithstanding. Tarot cards, do they tell your future? Tarot cards have been in existence for a very long time. If it was all just a bunch of hooey, why didn't it just disappear? Why didn't people just say it's a bunch of hooey? But it persists. Same thing with fortune cards and astrology. 
Did those stars way out there really have an effect on you today? What about your fortune cookie? Or the lucky rabbit's foot? Or a poultry bone that could grant your wish? How do we think then about labels and foods and drugs? What's the truth about vaccines? Can they really overload your immune system? Can they really cause autism? What is a fact? Well, in this definition, a fact is something known with certainty. As I've said, this seems to be something that changes with time. So really, a fact must be based on something time relevant, what we know now. What is the best knowledge that we have now that supports that fact? There, I used the word knowledge. Something asserted is certain. Certainly, we can realize that the Earth isn't flat, right? We think it's a fact that the Earth is round, and there's a lot to support that fact. What is a belief? As differentiated from a fact, a belief is a mental act or condition or habit of placing trust or confidence in a person or thing. Faith. The word fact and knowledge is not relevant in the word belief. You can believe whatever you want, and this may or may not have something to do with facts or evidence-based. Knowledge is the state or fact of knowing. It comes about from familiarity and awareness or understanding gained through experience or study. So we feel fairly comfortable with the fact that the Earth is round because we've seen it from outer space and you can watch a ship go over the horizon and there are a lot of things which support that idea. What is a theory? The reason why I really want to hone in on this one is because I think a lot of people uh, are not sure about this definition, especially as it's used in science. Especially when it's relevant to, say, evolution, which we will consider later on in this course. To say evolution is just a theory, um, really we want to understand what a theory is. Um, Gravity is just a theory, but if I took my keys out of my pocket and dropped them, they will fall. However, gravity has not been determined with certainty since Einstein. No one really is sure why that happens, or what is it that pulls those things down. So theory, then, in this first definition is what applies most widely in our consideration about science and theory. So a theory is the analysis of a set of facts, a set of facts, in their relation to one another. The theory of gravity, then, is a set of facts about why my keys fall to the floor. The general theory of relativity, as explained by Einstein, is about light and as it relates to time. The theory of evolution also is about how biological change occurs. I offset on this definition 4a as it relates to theory and its definition because its involvement with belief, which is more of a supposition. Hmm, I have a theory about that. When we use the word theory in that context, it is almost more of a guess. When we talk about theory in this class, we're really discussing this in terms of its scientific context depicted here under definition one. So what is science? What is knowledge? Hopefully that sets things into context as apart from belief. Science is a system for knowledge acquisition. Not the only system for, for knowledge acquisition, but maybe the best. Go back in history to Aristotle. At that time, People were discussing, what is reality? Where does it come from? Was there a central form out of which truth derived? 
truth with a capital T in Aristotle's sense? How do we get to know truth with a capital T? He devised a method, so-called scientific method, for knowledge acquisition. The other form proposed by the sophists at the day was that the form of the good emanated all reality. And you can maybe go back then and understand how Aristotle derived that method, but still today, knowledge acquisition is probably best gained by the scientific method, hypothesis making and testing. If not that, then this. No in-betweens. If you're going to devise, ooh, don't do that. If not this, then that. Not an in-between. That's how we gain knowledge. No in-betweens. This or that. And if you're going to make a really good scientific experiment, it's got to come down to that. This or that. Otherwise, just tell your mom. Who cares, right? I want to know this or that. And after we know that, then we can make another one that goes this or that. And we can build on that and so we can make cars and computers and stuff. So evidence-based knowledge grows on itself. And actually, it grows exponentially. You know? You guys are all used to thinking that things are happening linear linearly. They are not. The computers you have in your pockets would not have been predicted on a linear basis 10 years ago. No way. And so you think now that the things you have in your pockets are what's going to be something maybe slightly improved 10 years from now. You have no idea. This is happening like this. Same as knowledge. Throw in all of the people on the planet and man, it's really happening. So the scientific method is positioned in your book in chapter one. You really do got to get a handle on this because it's through this lens that we will understand how other things are made in biotechnology. It's not just willy-nilly, hey, I guess I got a good idea. It's got to be based on something that's been previously published. So you're going to make an observation. Hmm, I think maybe. Form a hypothesis. Ooh, if we test this or that, and we can make a testable prediction. If not this, then this. Does echinacea really improve your immune system? Let's figure out an experiment and do it. And measure it. And let the chips fall. Conduct that critical experiment and make the conclusions. Make new observations and revisions on your hypothesis. And on it goes. That sounds rather dry, doesn't it? The scientific method, blah, blah, blah. You've probably heard it a billion times already anyway. Is that how science is done? Not really. I mean, yeah, you have to do this. You can make a hypothetical study like does studying improve your test scores? I'm going to do that experiment. You know, I'll get to see this, actually, in this class. And you can see that, as depicted in this figure from your textbook, that students without a textbook score an average of 60% plus or minus 5. Students with a textbook score higher. Of course, this might be Jay Phelan's way of selling his textbook. We should be suspicious of bias in all of these studies. But nonetheless, you can make a study that would show these results and calculate them accordingly. But wait a minute, is this really how science is done? How did Thomas Edison come up with a light bulb? Have you ever considered this? He didn't invent the light bulb, by the way. That was already previously invented by a guy we don't remember, who put electricity through a wire or a filament of something, I think it was carbon, and it glowed. What Edison did was to improve on it. And he did all of these experiments to change the filament. And he went through lots of different kinds of things. 
until he came up with tungsten. And then he decided that this had to be in a vacuum because the air caused that thing to oxidize too quickly. So he didn't actually invent the light bulb de novo. He actually improved on it. And when a reporter asked him, you know, like, well, how did you do this? He said, well, science. And he said, I did a lot of experiments. And he asked him, how many did you do? And he said, 99. And he said, you had 99 failures? And he said, failure? I have a light bulb. Hmm. Persistence, learning something, basing something on some result and going forward. I would also suggest that there are really two kinds of science in my experience. One in which you're trying to make something work. Think of Orville and Wilbur. You're trying to fly, but you haven't any idea how to do that, other than maybe looking at a bird's wing, you know? And a lot of guys crashed and burned before Orville and Wilbur. And they were just bicycle makers, but they flew. And in my opinion, and in my experience, having done this a few times, making something is really hard. Then there's another kind of science where it is learning something, where you can actually, if you have the appropriate techniques, decide this or that. There were two researchers at Harvard who did it. the most elegant experiment maybe I can ever think of, Messelson Stahl. And they discovered how DNA replicates, whether it was semi-conservative, conservative, or in chunks. And they devised this experiment that it was either one, two, or three, and nothing else. And it was beautiful. So I would also suggest that creativity plays a big role in science. Uh, we're used to thinking about creativity in the arts. Mozart, oh, wonderful. Flash of genius sometimes, you know? And in my opinion, creativity in art is very similar to creativity in science. Yeah, the palette is different. The colors are different. The medium is somewhat different. But the same thing is true. And if you talk to people about creativity, most of the people that write those books aren't. Most of the people that are don't write books that describe it. I think that creativity comes about from a juxtaposition of ideas that doesn't normally occur. That there are some people out there who look at this set of facts over here and this set of facts over there and somehow there they are together. And they occur all over the place in all kinds of different disciplines. Art, and music, some people call that genius. Some people call it a quirk. Some people will look at that set of facts and that set of facts and can't think of them together. Creativity plays a large role in science. It certainly plays a large role in innovation. We are in a crisis. And one thing I have noticed about the history of science in general is that when people are in a crisis, they innovate. Like, you know, the bacteria in the tube. Jack, we got one minute left. Think of something. Let's not count on the economist. Do you believe in things you can't see? Like I said, you have a very limited scope of data. I think there are atoms and molecules that make up this podium. I've actually never seen an atom personally, but from what I've read and from the other experiences that I've been afforded, I think this podium is made of atoms. We'll get more into that in the next lecture, but actually, um, probably you all were exposed to this at some point in your education. What is an atom? I think we need to review that. What happens when atoms stick together to make molecules? I think we definitely need to understand that. And then because molecules come together to make life, and so we need to understand that. 
I've already suggested that the periodic table of elements is the same in the universe. I will make the suggestion that carbon-based chemistry is very important to life. Carbon has the capability of making molecules with sulfur, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and a few other atoms. You can't think of a multiplicity of chemistries that's based on any other atom. That makes carbon chemistry almost as important as water. Why is water required for life? Water is pretty weird stuff. Uh, we're all accustomed to it here, you know, and there's so much of it around on Earth. We're pretty lucky for that. But water is weird stuff. It expands when it freezes. You know, most stuff doesn't. Most stuff contracts when it freezes. And this is good for us because water floats. Also, water is very cohesive. Water molecules stick to each other. There are other properties of water which render it uh, you, the so-called universal solvent. It dissolves stuff. In fact, it dissolves all the stuff of life. Very convenient. Gets me back to that question, too. How did life start here? And if we think about that a little bit, we can almost think about how it might happen someplace else, too. Is there life someplace else? It's a big universe. Chances are, yeah. Uh, what would it look like? Well, if you think that you need water, and you think you need carbon, chances are pretty good it might look just like this, or something like it. How does it work? We'll get into that uh, in the next lecture when we consider from atoms out to DNA in the flow of life. But for this week, take a look in your book at the scientific method. And when you do that, I know that that's a pretty dry way of looking at acquisition of facts and knowledge. But just don't think of it like that. Think of it as more of a creative medium. Think of it the way Michelangelo might think of a chisel. That's not a block of granite. That's a David in there, as long as you take away everything that's not. As I mentioned, at the end of each one of these lectures, as uh, there are questions positioned throughout the lectures that we will involve you in the iClicker devices, you can see their answers. There will be the study guide questions at the end of every lecture. There were some at the end of the first one, which I didn't show you. Those would be 1 through 14, which you can see on Sakai. Um, 15 through 30 or after lecture number two. See you next week. <laughs>